so tonight's all about sacrifice, right? Uh, so first thing I'm going to say is the same thing that I said the first time that I was here last time. Remember our, um, we've got Mr. Fact, Mr. Faith, and Mr. Feelings. This is very important because all of us, me included, every single one of us have some form of bondage um, within us. And the shackles and chains tend to be our feelings, right? When we're told that we're wrong and something needs to be corrected, the thing that comes up is feelings and emotions. Right. Those are the things that get in our way. Those are the shackles and chains. So um, we've got three men who are up on a tall wall, a narrow way. And Mr. Fact can see where he's walking. He's walking along. Mr. Fact does great. And then Mr. Faith, he's behind Mr. Fact. Um, and as long as he keeps Mr. Faith, as long as Mr. Faith keeps his eyes on Mr. Fact, he's not going to fall off the wall. And then behind him is Mr. Feelings. Now, if Mr. Faith starts worrying about Mr. Feelings, and he takes his eyes off of Mr. Fact, he's going to turn around and check on Mr. Feelings, and both Mr. Feelings and Mr. Uh, Faith are going to fall off the wall. So Mr. Fact is the facts, not as society teaches, but as scripture teaches. The Lord promises us that he gave us this Bible, he gave it for a reason, there's not a single lie in the whole darn thing, right? And so as long as our faith are lined up with the facts, and as long as um, uh, we use that to harness and keep control over our feelings, then we don't have to go to the doctor because our feelings are taking control of our lives and messing everything all up. Instead, feelings become useful. Feelings become something that we can draw closer to the Lord with. Because when we are of His mind and of His faith, then our feelings are the same as His. It puts us in a relationship with Him. So you guys are going to hear some things tonight that might want to well up your feelings. Try to take control of that. Try to um, test that against the facts and have some faith. Uh, this is by Akrat's Leviticus, chapter 1 through chapter 6, verse 7. And so we're not really going to get into Leviticus right away. I'm going to recap some information here. So uh, Leviticus chapters 1 through 6, verse 7. They're all about sacrifice, right? So the whole book of Leviticus is all about sacrifice. One through six is about the very, all the nuances of actually performing an animal sacrifice, right? So before we get into that, we're going to talk a little bit about sacrifice. And that word sacrifice there, see how sacrifice is at the bottom of the screen? That word could be faith. That word could be holiness. That word could be uh, love. That word could be sanctification. We're looking at the story of Esther from the sacrifice point of view right now. So, who knows about the story of Esther? Okay, who's Haman in the story of Esther? And if you don't know Haman, who's a character that you know of in the story of Esther? Mordecai. Mordecai being Esther's... Uncle. Yes. In the story of Esther, he's representative of the father. Because he loses his relationship with, with Esther, his daughter. He's, she, he's, she's sacrificed to go save her people. Esther's a picture of the son. Okay, so... And then who's, who, who knows about Haman? Who's Haman? Yes. Yeah, he's one very powerful guy in the kingdom and he really hates the Jews. Yeah. He represents the devil, right? And then Esther represents the son. And the king, no one's probably going to guess that, but who does the king represent? Nope. The king is you. 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 Every single one of us are the king. Why? Because God has given us free will to reign over the choices that we make. And we've got Haman on one shoulder saying, hey, king, do these things. And we've got Esther on the other shoulder saying, no, king, do these things. 
but ultimately it's up to the king to make the decree, right? So that ties into sacrifice because that king, in order to save the Jews, he had to make a sacrifice. Uh, once the king's decree is made, there's no one doing it. He had to make another decree that went against his decree, saying, okay, yeah, you guys can go kill the Jews, but now the Jews can defend themselves. That was really out of character for any king. No king has ever made a decision like that. That was a huge sacrifice for that king to defend the Jews in that way. Um, in uh, last week's, uh, last time that I was here and I taught, I spoke about Yeshua's mission statement, how it's a twofold mission statement. The first thing he does is he comes in and he rescues us, right? Uh, in order for us to be rescued, we have to sacrifice stuff. So if I'm like swimming out in the middle of the ocean and a boat comes by and throws me a raft, I have to sacrifice swimming out in the middle of the ocean to grab a hold of the life raft, right? Because they're going to pull me into the boat. I've got to sacrifice the ocean for the boat. Um, but then once I'm on the boat and they've, you know, they've given me food and water and some rest, then they're going to start showing me the ropes, right? Then I've got work to do. That's the empowerment part. The people who saved me are going to teach me how to do different things upon the boat. So that's Yeshua's twofold mission statement, rescue and then empowerment. And that can be found in Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. In Luke chapter 4, he stood up, the attendant brought him the scroll, and he, he opened up the scroll to Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, and said, the Lord has anointed me. The, Lord, the, uh, the, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. He's anointed me too. And then he gives three examples of rescue, followed by three examples of empowerment, telling everybody, I'm going to rescue you, and then I'm going to empower you. And then they try to throw him off a cliff. <laughs> so um, this Yeshua's mission statement, this idea here um, is where all of us have to make some sacrifices. Because we're taught that we're just here to be rescued. That the enemy doesn't want us to be empowered. He wants the power. We have to sacrifice our rescue in order to start becoming more empowered. We need to be rescued from being rescued. <laughs> so there's some sacrifice there. And then we've got this idea, which is going to take more sacrifice, because the idea of the New Covenant in the Old Testament seems like it's crazy. But if you look at it, you see the New Covenant at work in Moses. That's what we learned in Kitisa, right? The people in Egypt, they were, they were rescued, right? It's this twofold mission statement. We've got Yeshua being rescued from, or I'm sorry, God rescuing the people from Egypt, bringing them out into the middle of nowhere. And then in Kitisa, he starts shifting to empowerment. He starts empowering these people. Um, so the first river they cross, they don't have to do much. They're just being rescued. The second river they cross, they have to do a lot. They've got to pick up their swords, and instead of God defeating the nation for them, they have to go defeat the nation with their own hands. They pick up the swords, they defeat the giants. They, at that point, are empowered to do God's will. Yeshua's twofold mission statement playing out in the Old Testament. You can see it playing out in Moses' life, Abraham's life, Aaron's life, the Israelite people's life as a whole. And what does it take? It takes sacrifice. All the people had to sacrifice some stuff from their past in order to be empowered. Um, okay, so that's the flurry of information. We're done with the flurry of information. Now we're going to start focusing, starting to hone in on our, um, our Torah portion here, Vayakra, and he called. Up to this point, we've, um, we've learned about Genesis. In Genesis, we have God created, then God flooding his creation. Uh, and then after the flood, what comes as a result of the flood? Then we start learning about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who uh, becomes Israel. And so uh, Jacob has Joseph. Joseph is a fulcrum point. He gets, rest he gets rescued from his brothers who were trying to kill him. God, you know, they, they throw he, he doesn't even have the power to be able to take authority over his own brothers. They throw him in a pit. He gets sold into slavery into Egypt. That, believe it or not, was rescued for Joseph. And then, well, you, you can't help but see empowerment in Joseph's life, right? He becomes the second most powerful guy on the planet. That's pretty powerful. How did he get there? 
He got there because God was working with him. The twofold mission statement. Joseph is our fulcrum point. He moves us from this Genesis idea to Exodus. He's the, he's the fulcrum point that, that moves us into the Exodus. Exodus is all about um, Israel, Israel's sons, his descendants, being rescued from Egypt. Um, I'm going to skip the walking between the halves thing. Okay. Uh, so Exodus is all about us getting rescued from Egypt. And then the next book, that's where we are now, Leviticus. We've got all this information in Genesis. We've got all this information in Exodus. And then Leviticus is nothing but talking about sacrifice. He takes an entire book to teach us about sacrifice in the tabernacle with the priests. Okay, so Leviticus is known as the heart of Torah. It's, yeah. it's, it's right in the middle. Um, it's also accurately describes our Father's heart. The heart, I should say, the heart of the Father. It accurately describes the heart of the Father. What else do I have written there? Yeah, it also accurately describes the heart of relationship, both with man uh, and with God. The world is not all messed up because it lacks sacrifice. Everybody everywhere is sacrificing for something somewhere all the time. The church is not all messed up because it lacks sacrifice. America is not all messed up because it lacks sacrifice. We're not all messed up because we lack sacrifice. We're all messed up because we lack sacrificing appropriately, right? Mm -hmm. Sacrifice is a very, very nuancy thing. You're, you're killing something and replacing it with something else. And we live in a time where what is good is called evil and what is evil is called good. And in Hosea, it doesn't say, my people perish for lack of sacrifice. It doesn't say that my people perish for lack of love. Right. I, know, I know people who claim to be in the mafia. I know people, when I was in college, I got into some really bad activities that involved uh, dealing drugs and just being a crazy hippie. I've been around business people, corporate people. It doesn't matter where you go. None of those people lack love. Right. Amen. They lack accurate love. It doesn't say my people perish for lack of sacrifice. My people perish for lack of love. It says my people perish for lack of knowledge. That's right. That's true. Ooh, that's we got to have our faith harnessed by our facts. And it's the Bible that tells us what those facts are. That's true. That's right. And then our feelings become useful as long as they're harnessed by those two things. Uh, so this tabernacle, right, we all understand that uh, we don't have the tabernacle today. And that doesn't mean that we throw out the books that tell us about the tabernacle. We know that the tabernacle is right here inside of each one of us, right? Yes. So we know that the tabernacle is inside our hearts. We know that this, these books are a picture that teach us about our hearts. So let's use them to do that. This is a living model of the Father's heart. So I don't know if you guys, who knows what a Venn diagram is? Is that? Yeah. There it is, yes. <laughs> Okay, so the way a Venn diagram works is it's two things. You're comparing two things. Apples are red and grainy, right? Oranges are orange. They have a peel in their section. See how they're on the outside? That's because those are things that they don't have in common. So in the middle, you have the things that are in common. So they're both fruit, they're both fr food, and they're both sugar. That's why. See how they share that space? That's how a Venn diagram works. So... Um, Here's some covenantal stuff that you're probably not going to agree with at first, but just bear with me here for a second. This is uh, basically dispensationalism, which is the entire church nowadays stands on dispensationalism so that I can throw the law out, because it's not trying to be fully obedient to the God, just partially obedient. So the way dispensationalism works is eh, right around the year 700 or so. I literally just pulled that number out of the air. I'm probably pretty close to being accurate with that. When I say the year 700, I mean zero is creation. Right now we're in the year 5700, about 300 years away from Yeshua returning. Um, so around the year 700 or so, the Abrahamic covenant. And then Abraham passes, and then we've got Moses about 700 years later, right around the year 1500. 
So Abraham's gone, so now those promises to Abraham are starting to fade away, and now the way that the Lord is working is the Mosaic Covenant. And then um, around the year 4,000, uh, Yeshua comes, and He changes everything, right? And now the Abrahamic Covenant's way gone. The Mosaic Covenant's out of the picture now, too, and now we've got the New Covenant. That's the idea of dispensationalism. I'm going to ask you to take a moment and just shelf that idea to see the truth, which is like that. It's true. Yeah. They all. They all do. A three cold, a three fold cord is not yeah. easily broken. That's right. Now, everybody here, you guys are here because you love the Lord. You're not here at church on a Sunday. You're probably going to go to church on Sunday too. You guys know your dispensationalism well, and I'm not telling you to throw it out the window because there's some truth to it. All the stuff that the Abrahamic covenant does not have in common with the New Covenant and does not have in the Mosaic common with the Mosaic covenant, you guys know that stuff. You guys know, and you know, and around and around. Yeah. Some of you might even know what the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant have in common in this little space right here. What most of us lack is this space right here where they're all working together to get along. I'll give you an example of this. The Abrahamic covenant is, uh, he promises Abraham that his descendants, right? You're going to have so many descendants, you're not going to be able to count them, right? Well, here's somewhere where this and that gets along. The Mosaic, comes, the Mosaic covenant comes along and it's Abraham's descendants where the Mosaic covenant is given to them. And then, um, so without the Abrahamic covenant, there is no Mosaic covenant because there's no descendants to promise to, right? So here we are in the new covenant and Israel's not grafted into America the way the church has subconsciously thrown at us. Right. We're grafted into Israel. That's true, mm -hmm. amen. That's what the Bible teaches us. And so without an Israel, which is the Mosaic Covenant, there's no new covenant. We have to be grafted in if right. we're going to be part of any of his covenants, right? So they all work together. That's, that's how that picture goes. That's good. All of this to uh, bring us to a point where we start talking about how important sacrifice is. Okay, so uh, where, are we, where are we here? Okay, we're at the introduction part, right? About three quarters of the way down the page. Okay, we're going to start getting to the point here where, where our note-taking people, you've got, you've got blank spots here, and I'll, I'll point them out when notes, when particular notes that I want you to focus on are going to be uh, brought to light. So Leviticus is known as the heart of Torah. It's right in the middle. It describes the heart of worship. Um, it's the first seven chapters. And it described about how exactly sacrifices are to be done. I'm going to say this again. I am repeating myself. The idea is that sacrifices are done in our hearts. Right? Yeah. So sacrifices are done in our hearts. And this book teaches us what um, a sacrifice from God is going to look like inside of our hearts. Right? So we should be looking for this. If we're, if we're at a point in our life where things are falling apart... And we want to fall back on the old ways because they worked in the past. But for the past few months, they just have not been working. But that's all we know, so we want to fall back on those ways. Instead, we want to have some faith. Well, what are we going to have faith in? This will give you some clues on what to look for. And I'm not going to tell you what to look for. I'm going to teach you how to read the Bible appropriately so that when you're reading your word on your own time, You've got a flashlight so you can see what he's talking about. And ask yourself, what the heck does a priest do? So he dedicated an entire tribe, right? A whole tribe to being priests. Would a loving father dedicate an entire tribe to doing something that's not that important? Do they really just take offerings and kill stuff? No, the, he wouldn't have them be, to be doing those things if they weren't deep, meaningful truths that bring us closer to Him. So chapters 1 through 2, they're all about offerings at God's table. What are they and what do they represent? 
We've got meat offerings, and we've got grain offerings. I'm pretty sure this is my last slide. Okay. So that's the slide. The reason I made those is for those pictures there, right? So you guys could see that picture, and you're not like, what in the God? heck is this guy talking about? Esther and Yeshua's twofold mission statement. He is wild. He's crazy. Um, okay. So what do these offerings represent? What do they mean? Meat offerings and grain offerings. Okay, so we've got three different types of meat offerings. We've got bulls, sheep and goats, and birds, right? Those are the three types of meat offerings, meat sacrifices that you can bring to the table. So uh, what does a bull represent when it says an offering from the herd? It's talking about bulls, cows, oxen, bulls. So way back in the day, when I say way back in the day, I just mean like 500 years ago and all of existence before then. So like the first like 4,000 years of creation. People needed bulls in order to eat because they would take... They, they have this ground that's too hard to plant seeds in. So they put a yoke on a bull's back, and that bull softens the soil. They couldn't put it on their children's backs. There's no way that the kids are going to be able to do that kind of work. They can't put it on their own back. They put it on a bull's back. And that bull, it doesn't matter what's in that ground. The bull is getting from point A to point B. There's no stopping it. Where, whether it's rocks or whatever, it's going to get through that ground. A bull represents work lots and lots of strength and work. Um, a bull is representative of the first letter of the Aleph bet. The Aleph. It's a picture of the father because that's the kind of strength the father has. He's getting us from point A to point B and there's no stopping him. You can join him or not. Either way, he's getting from point A to point B. So that kind of strength, when somebody brings a bull before the Lord, that's what's being sacrificed. That kind of strength within us. And there's very particular, and it's not just like, oh, I feel like that's what I want to sacrifice. It's not like a, hey, this is just what I feel like. It's a, I'm in this circumstance, and because I'm in this circumstance, the Lord says the appropriate thing for me to sacrifice right now is a bull. And back then, everybody understood, this is what it means, this is what's going on. So then we've got sheep or goats. That's, uh, that, that's your first note-taking thing that's highlighted on the other. Bulls, they mean work. That's important for you to know. That's one um, uh, piece of, of light for you. Then the next thing we got are sheep and goats. So think about a sheep or a goat's function, right? What does a sheep or a goat do for us? Uh, it provides us clothing. It gives us a covering clothing, and it also provides us food. That's pretty much the only thing that a sheep or a goat's good for from the flock. So that's what's being sacrificed. When you bring in a sheep or a goat, you're sacrificing your covering or maybe your idea of covering and your, um, and your food. I know that might not sound right, but think in terms of Yeshua. Yeshua was sitting at a well, and he hadn't eaten in a while, and his disciples are trying to take care of him. Father, Master, eat something, right? And they say, look, I've got, I've got food that you don't know of, right? That's the kind of food we're talking about. And then we've got birds. Well, what in the heck does a bird do? So when the spice of life starts to wane, you know, all the excitement of life starts to wane, I'd say the majority of elderly people, they become bird watchers. Right? I mean, who doesn't like watching birds? I think it's because of the nature of a bird. And when I say a bird, I'm not talking about women. I know that's something that people all that old bird. It's not what I'm talking about. Okay? I'm talking about something else. <laughs> um, so the birds are, are pleasant to look at, they have a beautiful song, right? There's something pleasant once the spice of life is gone and you start to have a deeper understanding of life. There's something pleasant about watching birds. There's obviously things to be learned from them. What I've got here, and I, I didn't get this from any other source, but it's my understanding that birds, they represent our song and our seed. 
They sing, some have a beautiful song, and don't look so good. Some look great and have a nasty song. <laughs> right? That's like us people. That's the way us people are sometimes. <laughs> um, and, then, and then there's the seed. That's like the real, like, aside from that part, that's like the real function of a bird. They take seeds and they, they scatter them far and wide. So sometimes we're to bring a bird for sacrifice when we're in that circumstance. That's what we're sacrificing. And then there's grain offerings. Grain offerings are my favorite. And it's because it because of what it talks about. So a grain offering is generally, generally flour, right? We've got flour, and well, think about, like, you know, we, get, we have flour, but think about everything that flour went through to become flour. First thing you had to do was you had to get an ox, and you had to plow out that soil. Then you had to plant some seeds. Then you had to water those seeds. Then you had to fertilize those seeds. You had to protect those seeds. At this point, that's several months of hard work, lots of faith being exercised. Then the plant grows, and then after the plant grows, then you harvest it. Once you harvest it, 90% of the plant gets thrown out. You throw out the weeds, you throw out the chaff, the only thing that's good is just this little top 10%, the seed. And then you take that seed, and you stick it between a rock and a hard place, and you pulverize it. You crush it into nothing until it becomes this fine powder. And at that point, then you take it and put it on a shelf. And when you're ready, you make bread out of it. That's what grain offerings are about, and that even is to be sacrificed to the Father. It's a lot like wine. Uh, so for, for bull, we've got work. For sheep, we've got food and clothing. For birds, we've got song and seed. Uh, for flour, flour is like wine. It's the same thing with a grape. You go through all that to get a grape, you take a grape, and then you ferment it, and then that turns into wine. And um, because our Father is all-wise and all-knowing, that represents His blood. Uh, and we never sacrifice any of our flour with leaven. If you're not sure what leaven is about, when you're celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread, ask your Father, hey, could you show me what leaven is about? Because yeah. that's the theme of that feast. Right. And if he's with you and you're ready, he's going to tell you what leaven's about. Yeah. And that does not get mixed with our sacrifices. Okay, then chapters uh, 3 through 7. So that was chapters 1 through 2. Now we're going into chapters 3 through 7. Um, it's all different types of offerings. We're going to dive into one particular offering, the peace offering. We've got uh, burnt offerings, peace offerings, sin offerings, trespass offerings, and all the different types of grain offerings. So um, the peace offering. This is where we start getting into the nitty gritty. This could get kind of gruesome because we're going to talk about killing things and then tearing them limb from limb, literally, is what we're going to be talking about. And we serve a God who says this is what is going on inside of your heart, beloved. Um, so our peace offering, um, our peace offering represents the true blood-bought seed of Messiah's, the true blood-bought seed of Messiah's willingness to sacrifice to be at peace before God. So this willingness thing is important. The very first word of Leviticus, Vayakra, and he called, right? Vayakra means he called. He called to Moses. And generally when he calls Moses, he's like, he calls to Moses and then he says, command the children of Israel. The word command is not in this one. The word command's not here. The coolest thing about the tabernacle is that was something that God says, this is what I would like for you guys to build. And then let every man bring of his own willingness. Right? And then they built the tabernacle based on their will um, to build it. It wasn't something that they were commanded or forced into at all. They did it and with alacrity. Um, so, uh, okay, peace offering. Why do we need a peace offering? Why do we have to sacrifice to be at peace with God? One, the Father, He has already sacrificed 
to reconcile us to him. He gave us his son. And then the son, he's already sacrificed to reconcile us to him. He took on flesh. He lived the way that we should as an example for us, as a sacrifice for us, and to show us how we should fulfill our roles the way he fulfilled his role, right? The, the, the law wasn't abolished. You never think that Yeshua abolished the law. He fulfilled the law. Right. He was our example. He showed us, hey, I'm fulfilling the law. Walk as I walked, right? right? I'm not doing this to humor the Father because he's wrong. I'm doing this because the Father's good and he loves us. And that put him in a position where he is now seated at the right hand of the Father, very, very much empowered. So it's our job to sacrifice things about us, to be at peace with this God, this very judgmental God, who's judgmental because he loves us. That's part of the idea of the peace offering. So he died on the cross, went to the center of the earth, preached the gospel to the lost souls there before ascending to heaven, where he is seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning forever and ever. They fulfilled their roles in being our rescuers and our leaders into empowerment. Authority over sin. Our job is to believe that we have not been rescued yet. To believe that we can be rescued and then to be rescued. Our job is to begin doing good instead of evil once we are rescued so that we can have peace with God. The doing good is the part that gives us peace with God. And there's no doing good without the sacrifice. And this um, peace offering is a, is a showing that, hey, Lord, I'm, I'm ready to start doing good. Okay, so uh, how do we differentiate between what to sacrifice and what to hold on to? I'm talking about parts of like who we are, right? Like, of my character, which I love, what part of me is no good, right? There's going to be men who tell me, hey, this is no good, and I, I love you, and I'm going, to, I'm going to work with you, and we're going to get rid of this, and we're going to hold on to this. Well, how do I know that I can trust man, right? I can, I can trust man based on, on my relationship with the Lord and the living word. So how do we differentiate between what to sacrifice and what to hold on to? In other words, what needs to be sacrificed? For instance, what if by accident on the cross, God sacrificed what is evil for what is good? That sounds completely preposterous, right? God made a mistake on the cross, and he sacrificed evil for good instead of good for evil. That sounds preposterous because Yeshua is perfect. But what if? How did that not happen? He was wrapped in flesh. It, it, it didn't happen because he... He knew how to sacrifice because he knew his word well and he used it to, to teach him how to uh, function before the father in a way that the father could judge him and say you're you're doing good okay so here are the different pieces of the sacrifice the sacrifice is without blemish so this points to and honors Yeshua. First and foremost, that's the most important part of any sacrifice. It's without blemish, points to Yeshua. It's the foundation of anything that is good. He is, was, and always will be without blemish. Okay, so now we've got the laying on of the hand uh, onto the sacrifice. So I've sinned. I've stolen something from my neighbor, and I did all the Torah stuff that I needed to do to make restitution with my neighbor. Now I need to go rest make restitution with my God. So I bring my, um, my sheep up to the tabernacle, and I bring it before the priest, and the priest is there to host this thing, to teach me the difference between what is clean and unclean, to teach me the difference between what is holy and unholy at this place. The only place on earth that God has ever said, hey, build this, build this this way, I will be there. So God is there teaching us these things along with these priests. And I, I brought my sacrifice and I take my hand and I put it on the head of the sacrifice. And what that does is makes atonement. So atonement and salvation 
are in the same wheelhouse, but they're not the same thing. Just because I've, I've done this thing and now I have atonement does not mean that I have salvation. I haven't even made the sacrifice yet and I've already gotten atonement. And I'm supposed to symbolically take my sins and pass it on to this animal. Keep that in mind as I back up here. In the first chapter, in the first couple of verses of Leviticus, and he called to Moses and says, when any of one of you brings a sacrifice of your own free will, do things in this way. When it says any one of you, it's when it, where it says any one, it actually says the word man. And generally in Torah, when it uses the word, uses a word to say man, it says ish. There's ish, man, isha, woman, right? So that's not what it says there. It says Adam. That's a highlight. He's saying it funny. Why is he saying it funny? Why is he saying Adam? If it was a snake, it would bite us. It's right there in our face. He's bringing us back to Adam. He's bringing us back to the garden, right? What happened at the garden? At the garden, he took the earth, the clay, and then his spirit, and he combined them together to make life. So the earth is really obvious, right? It's land, it's sea, it's animals. It's all that stuff that's around us. There's no getting away from the earth. Where we're in it, we can see it. It's the trees, it's all that stuff. But the spirit that he breathed into us, it's our breath. We need it every second of every day, but most of the time we don't even notice that we're doing it. That's kind of a show of, like, of God's character, how, how subtle he is, how laid back he is, how he's that still small voice for us. So why is he saying when an Adam brings a sacrifice and not when an Ish? He's talking about our very nature. The nature of us that is the earth and the nature of us that is the spirit. Can you guess which one he's asking for us to sacrifice? So um, when I'm laying my hand on the head of that animal and I'm symbolically letting my sin be on that animal, it's singing about Yeshua because he took my sins from me and he was wrapped in flesh just like I was, yet he did it in a perfect way. That gives me faith that I can do it too. It's one of his promises. It also symbolically shows that because I'm a man and I've got a sinful nature, I've got my head wrapped around this thing's mind. It's a representation of how, how do I word this? It shows man's propensity to sin having a grip on the mind and soul. It shows that sacrifice is necessary for that grip to be released. We saw that grip loosen in Ki Tisa through the plague of mourning. Okay, now there's the killing of the sacrifice. This is going to get gruesome. I'm about to say some gruesome things. So the atonement's been made. It hasn't been killed yet. And I'm about to kill the sacrifice. So I take this knife. And this is how, this is how it reads. It's not the, pri it, the priest does not do the killing. The man brings the sacrifice. The man did the sin. The man has to do the emotionally taxing thing of, of killing this best of his herd animal. Or best of his flock animal. So, I kill the animal, okay? So the animal's now bleeding all over the place and shaking and flailing about. And I just turn around and walk away, right? That's not how it goes. I've just killed this thing and now I have a lot of work ahead of me. I've got responsibilities to this animal that I just sacrificed. And in completing these responsibilities, I'm going to learn what's about to happen in my heart as the Father sacrifices parts of me so that His Son can live in me. So we're going to go back to functions. Thank you. Thank you for that. Amen. And, uh, and it's just as gruesome. I've been through lots of sacrificing me, and it's, it's gruesome. It's difficult. I've been through homelessness and all kinds of difficult situations. Not that nobody else has been through difficult situations. We're all people. We've all gone through bad stuff. But the difference is, is that children of God 
are not sacrificing for their own sake. They're sacrificing for God. It's, it, it is different. <clears throat> so we kill the sacrifice. Parts of us, not Yeshua, will die and be replaced with peace with Yahuwah, with the Father. We will think in a way and behave in a way that is not against Him, but purposefully and actively for Him. Peace with Him. That's what Yeshua's job is. His job is to change us so that He can pass us on to the Father and we can stand before Him and He doesn't have to shake a finger at us. He can look at us and say, I love you. You're doing great. Come here. That's the way He wants to be. But because He's put Himself in this leadership role as being a judge, if He sees something bad, He has to destroy it or else existence will not continue to exist as He's prophesied. So now that this animal's dead, now I have to start tearing it apart. I have to skin it, and then I have to start taking uh, uh, body parts out. out. And at this, as soon as the animal starts bleeding, that's when the priest starts doing some stuff, because I'm not allowed to touch the blood. The life is in the blood. The priest is the one who spends all day long with God. The priest is the one who knows how to handle that blood appropriately. And so he takes that blood, and he starts literally flinging it about, but in a very precise way, onto the altar, and onto the horns of the altar, and all these other very precise things, which we're not going to get into tonight. Um, the first thing that it mentions is the fat. So what is the function of fat? What does fat do? Does anyone know what fat does, like, biologically? It keeps you what? Keeps your body warm. That's good, yes. That falls under protection. That's that's one of its main things, protection. And another thing is? Provides energy. Yes, storage. Yes, it stores things and then it releases those things. Both good things and bad things are stored in the fat. Um, so. I want to give you a hug because I'm about to diss you a little bit on that. <laughs> you got to go really different this one. Well, so put on your thick skin because I'm about to diss you just a little bit, but not to be mean. And it's something that was already written here, so you set yourself up for it, brother. Okay, so it's a protective covering and it's a storage place. So here's the question with this fat, this fat that gets burned on the altar, gets separated from the animal and burned on the altar in a different way than the animal gets burned. Will you continue to protect the evil treasure stored in your heart, or will you sacrifice to protect the good treasures that are in there, dormant, just waiting to tap into all that potential growth that you were created to cultivate? Next, we move on to the kidneys. The kidneys function is to... Uh, filter blood, right? So uh, the life is in the blood. Will you continue to let evil things filter what you do and think your life? Or will you let what is good, based on God's, not the church's or the world's standards, filter what you do and think? That's what that, that kidney is about. And there's very specific things that are done with the kidney. Again, I'm just kind of showing you how to think as you're reading through this stuff so it's not just, yeah, 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 yeah. No, okay, the kidney means something, and with the kidney, this is done. That's how, that's how to read your word when it comes to uh, Viacra. The fatty lobe attached to the liver. This is my favorite one because this is the getting between a rock and a hard place thing. This is the getting pulverized part. I know that sounds weird that that's my favorite, but in my life, when I get pulverized, it doesn't ever kill me. I come out as a more valuable um, person, somebody that I value more, somebody that I respect more, someone that's more useful to God. So that fatty lobe that's attached to the liver, I'm not sure about this, but I would imagine that this is what this thing is for. So you've got the liver, which does 60% of the body's filtration. And then you've got the fatty lobe. It's like a big hunk of fat that's attached to the liver. I would imagine that that thing's job is to protect the liver. So if the body gets jarred violently, it's not going to damage the liver. The fatty lobe is going to take most of the brunt of that jarring. 
right? That makes sense, yeah? Okay, so um, the fatty lobe attached to the liver is protection about the body's largest filter and storage. What will you trust in? What will you show faith in when your body is jarred in an extreme way? Will you trust in the world's ways or will you sacrifice and show God that you love him? Have faith and trust in the ways that he is showing you through his scriptures, which several generations have lived and died to protect these scriptures for us. That they're true and they can be trusted. And then the last part about this is that the peace offering is burnt on top of the part offering. At this point, I'm about, it looks like I'm 10 minutes over time, so I apologize for that. I wanted to take this slowly so that it can be digested. Because it's taken me all week to put this together, so I had all week to digest this information. I didn't know all this stuff three weeks ago, okay? I learned a lot of this this week. It's been a blessing. Um, so, uh, you, never just, you never just sacrifice the peace offering. At no point has anyone accurately done a sacrifice and it's just the peace offering. It's always coupled with something else. I, I might be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure that that's how that goes. And in this first chapter, it's uh, the burnt offering, which is spoken of twice. So, he's highlighting, he talks about the burnt offering first, then some other stuff. And then later on in chapter 6, he starts talking about the burnt offering again. So the idea of, of the burnt offering is important. The idea behind the burnt offering is that um, this thing is burnt up wholly. And when you, when you burn a thing, it's chemically changed. It's no longer what it was before. It doesn't matter if you have a butterfly or a tree or an ox. If you burn it, it turns into ashes. And not different kinds of ashes, just ashes. It's chemically changed into this other thing. So um, that is what the peace offering is burnt on top of. Father, I want to be completely changed. And I don't want to just be completely changed. I want to be completely changed into something that's at peace with you. And I trust that you're going to teach me how to be at peace with you. And none of this is going to make any sense unless we fully submit to the Lord. And that's the basis of, of all Christianity. You have to give your life to God. Not one day, not one afternoon. Not one responsibility, not one person. You have to fully give your whole life to the Lord. Well, there's no deal. So then we've got our sin offering, our trespass offering. More info on the burnt offering denoting its importance. Grain offerings, as we talked about. And then uh, uh, a few things to keep in mind throughout the whole process. The end of Vayikra just kind of like randomly throws this in here. The fat and the blood are not eaten in sacrifice. Uh, you know, don't eat the fat and the blood. It doesn't matter if it's during sacrifice or at our table at home. We don't eat the fat and the blood. So there's two different types of fat. There's the kind, there's like, there's several different types of fat. There's the grizzle, which none of us really want to eat. And then there's like the tasty bits of fat that are on a steak that you cut, cut up into tiny little pieces and you have one little bite with each piece of steak because it's tasty, right? <laughs> am, I, am I the only one who does that? I used to just eat it in one bite, and then I started chopping it up into little pieces and having it with every bite, because it's so tasty. Um, yeah, God likes the fat too, but that part of the fat we're allowed to eat. And the part of the fat that we're not allowed to eat isn't even sold in the markets. It's called suet, and it's the fatty stuff that surrounds all of the organs. If you've ever, if you've ever field dressed an animal, when the organs come out, there's it, kind of like this gelatinous kind of sack thing, and I would imagine that's what the suet is. Same thing with the, uh, the fatty lobe that's attached to the liver. That's the part that we're told not to eat. You don't have to worry about that, because like I said, there's no market that sells suet with your steak. It's just not there. So you can't eat the fat on meat then? Yes. I didn't eat fat for a very long time until the farmer was like, that's talking about suet. <laughs> Which is a different type of fat. So you heard it from the farmer, you said? Well, I don't know if uh, Jerry, uh, J. Mary is a, a farmer or not. But I would imagine she knows farmers or something. And then there were other people. Well, Chris Cash, he does own a farm, and he and he seconded that. He actually like owns livestock. Yeah, down in Florida. Okay. Yeah. And same thing with the blood. We're not supposed to eat the blood. And as long as you're not Muslim, you're not going to eat the blood. The FDA doesn't let us slaughter animals in a way to where there's blood left in the animal. There's a reason why we don't eat those things. It's because that belongs to the Lord. We don't eat it in the physical because we're honoring 
and respecting something that's going on in the spiritual. The spiritual world is the only thing that's really true. All this physical stuff is all going to burn away. So if we start now honoring um, the spiritual world, then that you know that shows God that we we honor Him. Uh, and in the spiritual world, um, the fat and the blood is sacrificed at our Father's table, but it's only our Father's food. It doesn't mean that He's all alone in handling it. He's just all alone in eating it. The priest handles it and brings it to God in just the way that he wants it, prepares it for him, brings it to him, and all this stuff works together, and it's a sweet-smelling aroma to our Father. It's not that our Father likes the smell of burning flesh, it's that he likes the smell of his children being rescued from bondage, sacrificing for his sake. That's a sweet-smelling aroma to him, the same way that any parent has a sweet-smelling aroma when they see their kids just doing what's right. It's the same idea. Uh, so Yahovah or Yahweh, that still sounds weird to me saying Yahovah, but when I read it, that's what it looks like it's pronounced like, and even though that feels foreign to me, I know it probably feels foreign to you guys. That's how I've been saying it, because that's how it's spelled. And also, Jewish people know how to read Hebrew, and that's how they pronounce it too. It still feels foreign to me. So I, I apologize if it feels foreign to you, but I'm not thinking that is probably the way that his name is pronounced. Uh, Yahovah wrote the heart of his law with a massive focus on a guide to sacrifice in this physical world, to teach us how to sacrifice in the spiritual world. The beautiful thing about it is that he uses the problem of sin to provide the solution to teaching us how he wants us to sacrifice, how he wants us to be in relationship with him. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.